start the recording here. So perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. For those of the, who are intending, we're having a little technical issue, so I appreciate you bearing with that. But um, thank you for joining us this evening. This is the second of a series of several webinars that the NANS Residents and Fellows Section and Young Neuromodulators are hosting. The purpose of these modules or these webinars is to kind of create a several different topics within the realm of neuromodulation and um, that are applicable to trainees, fellows, and young or early career pain physicians. Um, we have with us a panelist of world experts tonight who will be talking about surgical techniques with spinal cord stimulators, um, who I'll introduce here shortly. Um, but before we kind of get into the introduction, I just want to give a pretty brief outline. We'll start off by talking about several different discussion techniques or discussion topics. Um, and towards the end of our webinar, we'll talk about um, we'll do a Q&A session followed by, or a polling question with several different board style questions, um, followed by a Q&A session if time allows. If we run a little late on time, um, we will get try to get to people's questions. We'll kind of post them on our social media format and kind of use them for social media content here going forward. And so before we start the webinar, I just want to go over a couple quick ground rules. Um, you can see in your Zoom webinar um, platform here that there's a Q&A feature. And so you can write those questions into there and it'll show up to the host and panelists. Um, the questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Um, the attendees or audience here will be kept on mute throughout the webinar, and this recording will be available on our YouTube page as well as our website here within 48 hours. Um, I'll get a little more details, but just overall, we have um, five panels total, or four panels with me as the moderator, so Dr. Provenzano, Dr. Ali, and going into Dr. Provenzano here, um, we're honored to have him with us tonight. It's kind of our honorary guest. Um, he's the president of Pain Diagnostics and Interventional Care. Um, interventional care. He serves on the Executive Committee of Medical Staff in Western Pennsylvania Surgery Center. Um, he got an undergraduate degree from Colgate, his medical university from University of Rochester School of Medicine, um, completed a surgical internship in St. Thomas or in Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, and a residency in anesthesia at the Western Pennsylvania Hospital. And he completed his pain medicine fellowship at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Um, some more about him. He's been um, I'll let you kind of read through here, but as you can see, very prolific researcher, um, very involved in numerous scientific art articles. He has a lot of interest in neuromodulation, monopolar and bipolar radio frequency, as well as healthcare safety studies. Um, he's on, um, he serves as an adjunct associate professor in the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center Department of Anesthesia Pain Medicine Fellowship. Um, he was also an ex officio board member of the NANS and previously served as secretary here. He serves on the board of directors of Azure Pain Medicine as the president elect. Um, he serves on editorial boards for scientific journals, including regional anesthesia and pain medicine as an editor, also uh, interventional pain medicine as associate editor in the neuromodulation section. In addition, he is the ASRA representative um, for pain medicine medical, American Medical Association House of Delicate Representatives. And here are his disclosures. Next slide for Dr. Ali. She's um, a neurosurgeon who trained at Henry Ford Hospital, completed her stereotactic functional epilepsy surgery fellowship at Vanderbilt University. She is currently assistant professor of neurosurgery at Michigan State University and director of restorative and functional neurosurgery, and she has no disclosures. For Dr. D'Souza, he's an interventional pain medicine physician, assistant professor, and neuromodulation director here at Mayo Clinic. His research interests lie in neuromodulation, regenerative medicine, and fibromyalgia. He's authored well over 80 um, peer-reviewed publications, serves on editorial boards for regional anesthesia and pain medicine journal and anesthesia and analgesia journal. As far as the closure, he has an in, um, investigator initiated grant with Nevro. Dr. Aruru is an interventional pain medicine physician at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. He's currently adjunct assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh with research interest in healthcare economics, value-based care, shared decision-making, and the application of quantitative research methods in government, healthcare institutions, and private industries. His research activities have been accepted in the highly regarded journals such as JAMA Surgery, Anesthesia and Analgesia, Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, the Spine Journal, Neurology, Neuromodulation, Neuroinflammation, and Neuromodulations, and many others. And as far as disclosures, he's a consultant for Medtronics and Boston Scientific. As far as myself, I'm a PGY3, PM&R resident at Mayo Clinic. I went to the University of Minnesota Medical School, 
um, in Duluth campus and completed my transitional year in Unity Point Methodist Hospital in Des Moines, Iowa. My interests include pain medicine, neuromodulation, and ultrasound. So now transitioning into our discussion, Dr. D'Souza, I was hoping you would start us off tonight and just kind of going over the process of a spinal cord simulation trial. Sorry, I just want to unmute myself. So absolutely, I'm happy to talk about that. So um, the biggest thing with spinal cord stimulation trial is it's it's not as hard as if you go uh, according to all the steps in line. I would say positioning is very key. It's a very underappreciated facet, facet of, uh, of uh, spinal cord stimulation trial steps. You want to make sure there's good enough uh, thoracolumbar flexion. So a lot of times I'll place a couple of pillows underneath the, the abdomen and get that arch. What that's going to do for you is that it's going to really open up your um, inner spinous um, uh, processes and is going to open up that inner space so you can obtain epidural access and then hopefully the rest of the procedure should be pretty straightforward when you place the leads. Um, the next thing that I tell patients uh, or the next thing that I kind of consider is the type of anesthetic. Uh, I've used a range of anesthetics for spinal cord stimulated trials ranging from nothing all the way up until um, you know doing a monitored anesthesia care with uh, propofol and dexmedetomidine. Um, so the biggest stimulus, uh, painful stimulus from a from a trial really is, especially if you're doing it percutaneously, is just local anesthetic, local anesthetic, um, and then really just the discomfort from just positioning itself. And so a lot of times, just a little bit of Versed, a little bit of fentanyl should go a long way uh, for making this possible. Um, the next step here, if you want to go to the next slide here, um, I think about where I want to enter. So in this uh, in this slide here, the epidural needle, the twee needle, is entering the L1 to 2 inner space. Whenever you wanna enter a specific inner space, you, we wanna start off at at least one pedicle level below. And the reason for that is because you want the, the needles and the leads to lay as flat as flat to the skin as possible. And that'll miss, make sure and make sure to drive the leads so that it goes, there's a higher chance of it going dorsally. If the needles are placed too perpendicular and too steep to the skin, you run a risk of potentially um, having the leads drive ventral. And that's not gonna do any good because it's a dorsal column stimulation here. In the next slide, what I usually do, actually the, the slide before that, I guess I guess it skips some of the animations. Um, so uh, it, what, what we do next is we, we, we uh, mark the pedicle levels, all right? So what I do is I mark the five o'clock position of the pedicle on the left side and then the seven o'clock position of the pedicle on the, on the right side. And that's where I'll numb my skin. Then I'll insert the TUI needle and go all the way until, until it touches the lamina of the inner space I wanna try to enter at. And I want to try, try to touch purposely when I try to touch lamina. That's because that gives me a good sense of depth. And then that way I know that I'm pretty close to entering the epidural space. So as I touch lamina and I slip off the lamina, um, that's when I hook up my loss of resistance range and I go all the way. And then I, I, as soon as I get loss of resistance, that's when you know you're epidural. And then you go ahead and thread those leads. And then in the next slide, you'll see that the leads are getting threaded appropriately. Um, and then as soon as I get to the appropriate level that I want to reach, and you can see my next slide after this, uh, you always want to confirm and get a lateral because you want to make sure those leads are laying in the dorsal uh, um, dorsal column. You will, you'll be surprised. There have been times where an, an epidural lead might look like it's being it's entering in dorsally and it's going appropriately, but a lot of times you won't be surprised that sometimes the, the leads can slip in the gutter and then it could look dorsal, but it could be slipping ventrally. And so always get a confirmatory view. The other thing I should mention in the next slide here is uh, after you have the trial leads placed, then you wanna secure it on the skin. So this is an important process because um, those trial leads are not uh, anchored. Uh, and so you wanna make sure you secure it so you have little migration, all right? Um, and there are different ways to secure these leads. So one common way that I usually do is there's something called stay fix, which is an adhesive patch. It's pretty sticky. That adhesive patch will hook on and, and, glue, and kind of secure the leads with a lot of adhesive. And then that adhesive gets patched onto the back. Um, it's a pretty pricey thing to, to, to take. So there are other techniques that other um, implanters can use. So another technique could be suturing, placing a suture to the skin and then tying a knot around those leads. Um, however, these leads are slippery. And so I've seen leads easily slip through the knots, despite it doesn't matter how hard you or how hard you tie the knot. And then the other option is that I've seen is actually using a stimulator lead uh, anchor and threading the anchor through the lead, deploying that anchor, and then suturing that anchor to the skin. So those are the three most common ways I've seen uh, trial leads secured. And that uh, that concludes my uh, part of year for the spinal cord stim trial. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. D'Souza. Yeah, that was very thorough. Um, 
So a great overview. Um, so I'm going to open up to Dr. Provenzano here. I know Dr. D'Souza gave a great overview. Did you have any additional thoughts um, on this uh, as far as the steps in the spinal cord simulator trial? No, I thought it was explained very well. I think that all those steps that were talked about that are not that glamorous, removing the lordosis, positioning the patient correctly, how you should cure the leads, I think that's critical. I, I personally like to enter on the same side with both of my leads because when I'm when I'm going to operate, I want to make I don't I just cut down right on both both needles, two needles. So I basically do the trial the way that I want to do the implant. So if I understand how I'm going to place the leads during the trial, it gives me a good indication how I can place them during the, the implant stage. Um, I do really emphasize as it was emphasized that you need to check your lateral. There's plenty of times that you place a lead that it looks posterior, it looks midline. And then when you go to the lateral, it may have gone anterior. I think keeping your angle of your two needle really low. And a lot of that has to do with making sure that you go down far enough. That was discussed to make sure that your angle is less than 45 degrees. I think that helps keep it in the posterior epidural space and it's also easy. Also, one of the things when you're working with these needles are obviously 14 gauge. And if you, you wanna do everything to limit uh, intrathecal penetration. And so I think you get a lot of false loss of resistance. So hitting the lamina first, as was emphasized, is also critical because then you know you're getting close uh, when you place your lead. But I th the last thing I would say to a person placing these systems, I think sometimes in busy life, we forget what we're doing. We're sticking a big needle by the central console control system of the human body. And so I think we have to respect it. And so if you're struggling or it's hard, just take your time and do the right thing. Great. So we'll go on to the next question. This one will be for Dr. Ali. Um, sticking on the theme of spinal cord simulator trials, um, Dr. Lee, I hope you can go to the next slide and help us talk about what your definition of a successful trial is. Uh, thanks, Brandon. So, um, you know, if you're if you're looking at the the definition that's mentioned in most published literature, the uh, percentage of improvement that a lot of insurance companies are looking for before they will clear the permanent implant is the fifty percent mark. Uh, so any uh, improvement, 50% or more, is considered significant or meaningful and will get you entrance approval uh, to proceed with a permanent implant. However, um, you know, as, as we proceed in our careers and uh, what we see is it's, it, it needs to be a more nuanced approach. So a 50% improvement is great, but when you look at the patient holistically, Taking somebody's pain from a 10 to a 7 is quite a meaningful improvement if it means that they can go back to work, they can walk around the house, they can take care of their daily activities, walk the dog, etc. cetera. So um, the percentage point is important from a um, uh, literature perspective. It's important from um, an insurance perspective, but as clinicians, we do need to be mindful of the, the actual impact that the, that the spinal cord simulator trial is having on, on each individual patient. Um, other than just the degree of pain relief, other factors to look at um, are improvement in um, sleep, improvement in mobility, improvement in the ability to uh, perform activities of daily living, uh, ability to get through a full day of work without having to take multiple um, breaks. Uh, so all of these uh, should be factored into what constitutes a successful trial. Great, yeah, that was um, that was perfect. That encapsulated a lot of the trial. Um, opening up to you, Dr. Provenzano, is there anything else that you specifically think about or consider when you're trying to see if someone had a successful trial? Yeah, so I think that was really well explained. If you look at a a trial. It's a true test. And I think in pain medicine, unfortunately, we're dealt to deal with subjective outcomes that are very challenging. And I think if you look at published research, we know that 
pain scores, we have a study that we're presenting in upcoming meetings. I will tell you that trialing outcomes, they have some correlation with implant outcomes, but they're not like 100% correlation if you look at it. You're looking at sometimes correlations less than 50%. And so trialing, really what trialing comes down to me is, did it help you? And we can talk about the exact cutoffs or 50% what you at least need. Was it really, really helpful to you? And number two, are you accepting of the technology? I think that that's really what you can figure out during the trial. And I think the most, one of the most important things are people that don't do well with trialing, that you avoid implanting them. And I also think in pain medicine too, when someone comes back after a trial, you remove the leads and you let them go home and think about it. Right? That is not the time to make the decision right then and there whether they're going to implant. As you get farther along in your career, the last thing you want is to implant someone that is not going to do well. And so I always say, go home, think about it, come back in two weeks, and we'll make a decision together. But there's, I don't think you can look for functional outcomes and you can ask them, could they do more things, which I think is important. You, I don't think you'll see significant reduction in pain medications during a trial for a short period of time. But even functional outcomes, I think we've set the bar really high for our technology. If I, I always think uh, I used to do orthopedics. If you repaired someone's ACL, they still would not play a professional football or a sport for eight to nine months. So the reality that we're going to do a three to five day trial and that you've been deconditioned and now you're going to just be able to do everything that you weren't able to do before, it's not going to happen. So again, to me, it's as simple as, was this really helpful to you? And are you accepting of the technology? Great, thanks. So yeah, move on to the next question, the next slide here. And um, Dr. Aru, I was hoping you could kind of segue into this topic as we kind of now talked about what a trial encapsulates. And now I know a lot of their similar surgical techniques, but I was hoping you could talk to us about the process of a spinal cord stimulator implant now. Absolutely. Thank you, Brandon. Um, and I truly want to echo Dr. Provisano's comment early on. When you take a patient to the operating room, the respect for the human body is extremely critical. You're given a privilege to not only help this patient get better, but you're actually given a privilege to perform and operate like a surgeon. And it's really a privilege because that, that individual you're taking care of is entrusting their life in your hands, regardless of the setting you are, surgical center, private practice setting, or even in a hospital, it's always remember to keep that in mind. Now, having said that, the process of implantation can be really exciting. It really could be. And when you walk in there, one of the things I always encourage younger physicians like myself who are starting a busy implant uh, implantation practice, or even if it's not busy as well, is have a preference sheet. When you walk into the operating room, make sure you know what you want so your team is aware of it. And it could vary from making sure the team knows your instruments, the equipment you want, including sutures, including prepara preparation, and even as far as a dressing that you prefer to use for these cases. And the reason why I bring that up is that that set the tones for really the entire trial process and also have a good conversation with anesthesia. Now, having said that, when you actually start the implantation process, the critical part is and most people do it differently. So assuming the patient's laying on the table and you're going with using an anesthetic care that is moderate sedation or where you're applying a MAC technique where the patients can collaborate, talk to you, converse with you during the entire process, the first step is you have adequate depth of anesthesia and you identify your midline incision point. So very commonly T12L1 is the entry point for a lot of uh, practitioners. I personally make my incision at the inferior border of the L1 transverse uh, spinous process and extend it all the way down to the inferior border of L2 spinous process. When you have that midline approach, you cut down, you can insert your TUI, gain access, similar technique you did for the trial. What's going to be very interesting now, though, is you have a different sense of depth perception. So there are two types of accessing the actual interlaminar space during perms. You can have a cut down approach 
where you cut down and you actually put the TUI in there, or some providers prefer to just repeat how it was done in a trial. And then after the TUIs are in place, you can then cut down and further continue your dissection. However way you prefer, I do think it's very dependent on the, on the, on the surgeon and whomever performs the cases. I, pre I preferably do a cut down first and I get my TUI in, get access, thread the wires up or thread the, the, uh, the leads up to the desired location. And then at that point, when you're done, the next reasonable step would be to create a pocket. Now, it's very interesting with pocket creation because when you look far back in the history of when stimulators were actually done, initially the conversation was, do we put it in the belly? Do we put it right above the buttock? Do we put it right around in the, in the lower portion of your back? Um, but very so often now, the, a lot of the paradigm shift of practice has moved towards the batteries of the IPG pocket being created around the buttock area. I call it more towards the iliac fossa, but just enough that it's below the waistline. Now, prior to the case, it's highly recommended that you actually understand the patient's waistline. And the reason why that's, that's, that's critical is you do not want the IPG pocket to rob on where patients actually put the bands of their pants on, you know, just partly because of skin irritation, and it could get very uncomfortable. The thing you want to really pay attention to is as you create, as you think about where you create this pocket, take advantage of the x-ray because you do not want to have a lot of the implantation to be done around the iliac crest or areas where the cluneal nerve actually travel through because that could result in significant pain if you choose to do implantation in the buttock area. Now, assuming you find the right location, whether it's in the buttock, whether it's above um, the belt line, depending on the patient's habitus. The ideal depth is you make an incision right around two to 2.5 centimeter, just, just roughly around an inch, not more. The reason why that's critical is, you know, a lot of the devices have to, in fact, all devices have to communicate with, with a charging system, except if they're primary cell. So the depth is really critical because if it's too deep, then you have a hard time with charging the system. Now, assuming you pick the right depth, you have access with your TUI needle in an interlaminar space, the next stage is tunneling. Okay, you get a tunneling device. Every company varies, you know, and every company you use would have a different angle and style to the curvature or the handle holder. And what you do is you tunnel through connecting the IPG sites to your midline incision. At that point, you've removed your TUI, you're connecting the wires, the, elect, the, the leads, to, through the tunnel, and you're connecting it to the pocket where the IPG site is created. It is extremely critical that if you choose to actually do a curved needle tip, that that curved tip is facing the superficial portion of the skin instead of facing downwards. And the idea is to ensure you stay superficial as you thread the tar as you connect the tunnel from the pockets to the midline incision. Now you're connected between the midline incision and the pocket. What's uh, one of the things that is extremely critical before you do that, and I got to say this, it's extremely critical is anchoring. Okay, because tunneling sounds, I get, I get excited. I don't know why, it's one of my favorite part of the procedure, but prior to tunneling, I really got to stress this, extremely important. You have to anchor correctly. And anchoring could be a tricky process depending on the body habitus of the patient you're working with. The, the, the rule of thumb or the conventional teaching is you want to find the thoracolumbar fascia, which is an area in the spine if you dissect correctly. It allows you to anchor the spinal cord stimulator lead so that when patients move, whether it's lumbar flexion, extension, or rotation, the muscle contraction does not impact migration of the lead. So Taking the time to find that thoracolumbar fascia is extremely critical. When the anchoring is done, you can successfully tunnel, connect the leads to the IPG pocket. I'm extremely cautious and very careful when it comes, with, comes to handling the IPG. So one of the things that I do intraoperatively is less hands on that IPG, the better. I do use the, uh, the Pirate's pouch to ensure that we can you know, minimize infection. Um, and honestly, it's truly, truly a phenomenal procedure if you do it correctly. Now, when the leads are connected, 
you put in the IPG in the pocket. One of the things I want to really mention is when you create that pocket, guys, it's extremely critical. You look for a plane. The IPG sits in the muscle plane, okay? And the plane could be above. Uh, hopefully, you know, you probably don't want to put it too deep, like I mentioned, but you want to find a very nice plane that is adequately dissected so you can set the IPG in that plane. And here's the reason why. I've seen this a lot. A lot of my patients, they would do better and actually lose weight. And if you have the IPG in subcutaneous fats, you run the risk of really rotation and having a lot more, you know, having patients go through some discomfort down the line. So finding the right plane is extremely critical. Now you find the right plane, you've connected your lead, the IPG is in place, you cover the incision, obviously performing this with sterile technique, I do irrigate, over maybe sometimes over maybe too much, but I irrigate a lot to ensure that that incision, that wound is clean, it's dry and intact. You cauterize appropriately to ensure that you do not have um, any micro bleeding. Use your mosquitoes if you have to. Um, I usually have a bipolar and a unipolar lead available, a unipolar um, electrocautery unit available. Um, and and the, the reason, especially when you're getting lost in the interlaminar space and you have your TUI in place, remember that TUI connects to the epidural space. So I, I err on the side of caution to use a bipolar versus unipolar so you don't directly deliver electricity to the epidural space. So now moving forward, you know, like assuming you've made all the connections, now it's time for closure. And one of the things that is critical is the layers of your closure. I still do a three layer closure. And the idea is you want to put the initial deep fascia in place. And I do an interrupted to actually bring the dermis and the deeper tissue layers a lot more in place. And then I run a subparticular. Um, the subparticular, you can use dermal bonds afterwards. I think it's overkill, but it still works. And the rationale behind that is if you put a derma bond over um, a lot of the skin incision and patients choose to shower, is you have an added layer of um, water resistant protection over the skin. So, um, you know, this sounds like a very long uh, descriptive process for the permanent implantation, but the key part here, and, and I tell every, um, every physician I work with is you, you have to remember there are stages to this. Discuss with anesthesia, make sure the team understand what you need. You have access to the epidural space, you create your pocket, you anchor correctly, you connect the leads to the pocket in a sterile fashion and you close your incision. When successfully done, you can actually give yourself a pat on the back that you've completed a permanent implantation. But I, but I say this because um, the steps vary from one provider to another, but in a very simple narrative, that would that's how I think about a permanent implantation right from the entry uh, to the epidural space, to the skin closure. That was fantastic. That was super helpful. Um, regarding Dr. Provenzano, I know Dr. Rue did a great job with the implants. Did you have any thoughts or anything else to add to that process? I thought it was really well explained. I think the emphasis on anchoring is critical. I think if you look at Failures of SCS, one of the big failures is lead migration. And so anything you can do interoperatively to limit that lead migration. The other pearl that I would give is you get so excited, you place your lead, you remove your 2E needle, you place your anchor, make sure you take pictures during the operation as you're working with the lead. I think a lot of migration probably occurs even before you leave the OR sometimes. And so make sure that you, what I do is I place my anchor, have my sutures in place. And then before I tighten everything, I make sure that it hasn't migrated during the, when I'm handling it. Um, and I think closure as was discussed is critical. Not touching the device, you really should not touch the device until you're ready at the end. And you know, if you look at joint replacement surgery or other replacement surgery, you, you take in all the steps not to even contaminate that device at all. The last thing I would say about implantation, I think a lot of success of implantation occurs before you even come to the OR. And that is optimizing the patient for the surgery and limiting your risk factors uh, for infection, whether that's smoking, glucose, staphylococcus aureus colonization, but all those things make a good implant. And those are decisions that you made even before you got to the operating room. 
Great. We'll move on to the next question, but Dr. Provenzano um, asked this for you as well. I'm um, hoping you can talk to us a little bit about the different types of implantable pulse generators, you know, what types are out there and how you decide which type you're going to use. Sure. So I will keep this uh, brand neutral. So basically, there's two main decisions. You have a decision whether you want to use a rechargeable or a non-rechargeable system, and then there's obviously RF systems. But let's just stick with rechargeable versus non-rechargeable. I think there's multiple reasons uh, to consider a battery. So if I look at from a healthcare economics and a societal standpoint, if you're going to consider a non-rechargeable battery, it needs to last a long time. That's the, the bottom line. We're putting an, anywhere between a twenty dollars to $30,000 device into a patient. If you're going to have to change that device every three to four years, that's very expensive to society. I believe it puts the therapy at jeopardy because currently in our country, when you look at payment structures, there's no difference in payment between a rechargeable and non-rechargeable battery. So if you have to change your battery every three years compared to one battery that will last nine to 10 years, that's three battery changes. And the, and the current reimbursement in the United States does not account for that difference. So that becomes very costly to the society. And I think we have all some... Uh, we have to be smart financially for the system and also for society with these devices. The next thing that I think we have to realize if, if you want to use a non-rechargeable system is why would you may want to consider it? Well, some people may not want to recharge, right? So they don't like the burden of recharging that it may be complicated for them. However, I don't think that it's really that complicated to recharge these days. I think that it's, but there may be some people that don't want that. But again, First thing you have to understand is the longevity of the device. That's going to be the, one of the major things that I'm looking at. And also, I think people change with time, and your programming desires may change with time. So if you look at a non-rechargeable system that's going to be using a certain program, and its estimated life expectancy is five to six years, make sure you understand what would happen if you altered that programming. You decide to change the pulse width. You decide to change the frequency. You decide to change the amplitude, which is going to lead to higher levels of energy utilization. Make sure it's still going to last. And then I think the, the last thing is that we are humans. We're not cars. And so when you operate on people multiple times, the tissue's not the same as it was the time before. Every time you make a decision, you devascularize the tissue. Every time you make a new pocket, you devascularize the tissue. And so I think... If you're 30 to 40 years old and you're looking at maybe a battery replacement, say it's three to six years, somewhere in between that, that could be five battery replacements in your lifetime. That's a lot of battery replacements and a lot of surgeries. So when it comes to me making a decision between a non-recharger and a recharger battery, it comes down to what the patient desires. Do they want to recharge? Do they have the capabilities to recharge? And if I have an older person, that's just going to be very burdened by the technology. Maybe a non-rechargeable is applicable. And then again, I have to look at how many reoperations I have to do. And then I think again, as physicians now, there's no doubt with costs, we have to look at the healthcare economics of using a non-rechargeable system and what it looks like to society if we want to offer this technology to many people. If we believe that non-rechargeables are the best option, uh, but they're only going to last three to five years, there should be a price differential. There's no doubt compared to a battery that maybe lasts 10 years. Um, so that's that's how I look at it with these technologies. And again, I also want to understand programming capabilities. When I started 16 years ago, you just, you turned it on, got some tingling in a certain area and you moved on. Now, if I look at all the programming capabilities that have changed, I want uh, implants, uh, implantable pulse generator that has capabilities of changing. And so if I'm using a rechargeable versus non-rechargeable system, I want to make sure that I have those capabilities and that, that my energy usage is not going to deter my ability to use certain programs. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Ali, this next question is going to be for you. Um, and it's going to be regarding um, paddle leads. Um, I thought your neurosurgical expertise could kind of help us um, differentiate, you know, when would be a good time to use percutaneous paddle leads versus paddle leads. Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts on that topic? Uh, great question, Brandon. So I think um, at, in this day and age uh, where we want to be minimally invasive and or, you know, minimally destructive to, to a lot of tissue, it makes sense in, um, in most patients to at least start out with a percutaneous uh, trial and then see how things go. Um, 
the the few patients where we would consider um, straight up starting with a paddle trial even uh, are people where a percutaneous trial was attempted but uh, couldn't be completed either because of scar tissue or unfavorable anatomy, bony spur formation, et cetera, um, or there was um, obstructing hardware uh, that prevented, uh, not in the area of interest, but in the area where the entry, uh, epidural entry needed to occur can, can, can also affect uh, the, the, the paddle placement. Um, Folks who have had percutaneous leads in the past, but have uh, recurrent lead migration uh, are would also be considered uh, good candidates for paddle placement. And then lastly, um, you know, as your picture nicely denotes, the, the paddle leads are uh, give a wider coverage. So um, if there are patients who not only require just midline coverage, but also require some paramedian coverage for, you know, let's say back and lower extremity coverage, sometimes uh, the paddle leads can provide more options for them by, by concentrating the, the stimulation um, in, in a more wide fashion. Um, typically, the, the area of the dorsal column covered um, is, is shorter with paddle leads, uh, whereas with percutaneous leads, you can kind of um, um, stagger them and, and cover a longer area of the dorsal column. But if, you're, if you find yourself using, you know, sort of the middle portion of your percutaneous leads, you can safely uh, replace that with a paddle in, in the appropriately selected patient uh, that we talked about earlier um, and, and concentrate that current in the area that is, is truly going to uh, give the patient the, their dermatomal um, area of uh, pain relief that they're looking for. Um, as for the procedure of um, Putting the paddle leads in, um, as, as you know, it's uh, a little bit more invasive. Similar principles, you know, you have to preoperatively optimize the patients, make sure their risk factors are appropriately controlled, you're minimizing risk factors for infection, um, managing their blood thinners that can lead to epidural hematomas and or, or, and, or pocket seromas and hematomas. Uh, you want to start uh, about uh, one and a half to two uh, laminar levels below the area of interest. Make a small laminotomy after making a midline incision, taking down the fascia and muscle um, on either side of that lamina. Uh, once you're done making your laminotomy, uh, typically you place a feeler just under the bone and within the epidural space to take down any uh, epidural adhesions that might obstruct uh, appropriate paddle placement. Uh, there is a radio loosened uh, passer that typically um, is um, a part of the kit, regardless of which company you're using that you can place in the epidural space to ensure uh, midline placement uh, by checking your um, AP fluoroscopy and then uh, checking a lateral to, to make sure that the lead isn't uh, rotating. Um, once that's done, you can place the permanent paddle. Once again, verify with fluoroscopy that you're ending up at the level that um, uh, was intended. Um, I typically want to bury the entire paddle under the lamina. That is what ensures good um, contact of the paddle with the epidural space. Um, um, and then you can anchor the paddle lead to the, the fascia, as Dr. Ruber had mentioned, it's, it's the best um, area to, to anchor these leads so that muscle contractions um, affect lead position. Um, I tend to leave a, a small strain relief loop 
um, within that space uh, prior to tunneling the leads. And then the rest of the process is very similar to uh, percutaneous human placement where similar principles are followed uh, for pocket placement and tunneling. And as Dr. Provenzano had mentioned, verify, verify, verify. So make sure you're uh, checking fluoroscopic images um, after anchoring the leads and tunneling. And then I will uh, typically take a final shot once I'm ready to close fascia as well. Awesome, that was super helpful. Thanks for that overview. And yeah, definitely your neurosurgery uh, skills definitely are helpful here in this um, question. And so we'll go on to the next slide here for Dr. D'Souza. Um, Dr. D'Souza, hoping you can talk to us about a staged spin spinal cord stimulator implant and why it's used. Yeah, that's a great, thank you, Brandon. That's a great question. So a staged spinal cord stimulator implant is actually a topic that's not often covered in fellowship programs and it's not very common either. So. Um, the, the primary goal and objective of a spinal cord, a staged spinal cord stimulator implant is to reduce the amount of times you are going into the neuraxial space. So one of the most common reasons for that is typically um, in patients with a high risk of bleeding. So in a patient that you're bridging anticoagulation or if they have a coagulopathy of some sort, you want to try to limit the amount of times you access the epidural space and the neuraxial space. And so we'll go over each one of these steps here with some, with some graphics here. But before we do, um, the, the basic gist of a stage one um, of, of the SCS uh, stage uh, implant is to, you're gonna surgically place and anchor the leads. Um, so you, you'll, you'll make your midline incision, you will enter the epidural space, you'll place those leads, you'll anchor them. And then you're gonna place a separate extender lead that's gonna connect to this main lead. And that lead's gonna be tunneled uh, to an external battery. All right, so that battery's external and then that battery will be patched on and the patient goes home, uh, gets to trial that, uh, that uh, new stimulator implant there. Um, and assuming they get 50% or more relief, they'll come back, you'll open up that midline incision, you're gonna disconnect that connector lead and that's gonna be removed because that external battery is external. So just, somebody's gonna pull that external battery out. That side is non-sterile. So uh, that side is draped out of the surgical field. And then basically, again, you're gonna open up that midline incision uh, but you're not going to manipulate any of those leads in the neuraxial space. And that's where the ben benefit comes into play because you're not um, manipulating leads there and hence you're decreasing the risk of potential neuraxial hematoma. And then basically for, this, for the stage two trial or stage two implant, you're just tunneling those leads into uh, the IPG side on the opposite side. So let's go over this in, in each step here. So you have your patient here and I'm just going to go over through each animation here. So hopefully you can see that there is a midline incision here that we're making. Once we make that midline incision, you're gonna go ahead and place your, your spinal cord, you're gonna get epidural access, you're gonna place those leads, you're gonna, you're gonna thread those leads to the level that you're going to, you wanna, uh, uh, the final leads to be uh, placed, and then you're gonna go ahead and anchor them, all right? Now you're gonna have a second set of extender leads. So this, the leads in yellow here are separate. They are not from, they're not part of this lead right here, they're extender leads. You're gonna connect those leads to the, the leads in the, in, the, in the midline incision. And then you're gonna tunnel those leads to uh, an external battery. So this battery right here is external and it's, it's linked to these uh, tunneled leads. And then basically you patch it all up, you close this all up, so you secure, you suture everything up and then you send the patient home, all right? And then the patient gets a trial uh, and test this out for five to seven days. Usually we like to be on the lower side for these staged implants. Uh, because again, there's a high risk for potential infection, primarily in this IPG site. So let's say the patient goes and tests this out for five days in the stage one of this implant. They get 50% or more relief or they get, get a successful trial. They come, you, they come back to the OR and basically you're gonna go back here. You're gonna, this is, you're gonna basically make, you're gonna drape this part out here. You're gonna, you're gonna put a drape in this, this uh, external battery is all, outside of the sterile field, because again, this is an external battery and there's a high chance of infection. So all that is draped out there. You're gonna, you're gonna prep this area right here in the middle. You're gonna make your midline incision. And what you should find there is hopefully the leads that you already placed. These leads right here in the middle are already, are already um, anchored and secured. You don't wanna touch those. You do not wanna manipulate those. That's the goal of a stage spinal cord stimulator implant. Right, and then that reduces the amount of neuraxial manipulation of these leads. 
What you do want to do, though, is these leads, these that are tunneled in here, these external ex extender leads, you want to disconnect them uh, from these main leads in the middle. And then somebody from underneath the drapes from the non-sterile side is going to remove that battery and that lead and the, and the battery is going to go out. So now you don't have these leads anymore. You don't have that battery, that external battery. And the next step is to create a, a pocket side incision on the opposite side that's already draped and prepped. Uh, and then you're going to basically tunnel new set of leads here and extender leads and hook it up to the midline leads and place a new battery. And you're going to implant this battery. And that's your stage two. And then you basically close it up. And there you have your stage two implant done. And uh, that kind of concludes everything. So, so really, again, the goal is, as you, as you saw from all these steps, is that we really decrease the amount of times we manipulate the neuraxial space. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated. You are, you're, you know, you're tunneling from one side, and then you're removing those leads, and then you're creating an, uh, an a pocket side incision on the other side. So it is complicated from that standpoint. There is a risk of infection, but all that is being done to prevent the amount of neuraxial manipulation that you have. Thanks, Dr. Souza. Yeah, those graphics are super helpful. Um, the next question here for Dr. Aruru, hoping you can take this one away. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the process of this trial and implant, and I was hoping you can spend a little bit of time talking about what happens after the implant. Absolutely. Thanks, Brandon. So the key part here is the trial's done, the permanent implantation's done. What's next? You know, I think the next step really starts at the PACU or, you know, the post anesthesia care unit when you actually are done performing a trial. There's, there are multiple school of thoughts regarding do you start, do you turn on the stimulator right after the surgery? Do you wait till they come back for follow up? You know, based on my training and you know, personal preference, I personally do wait till the patients come to the clinic before I turn it on. And partly why I do that is because. Sometimes it's really hard for the patients to differentiate the chronic pain from the actual acute on chronic pain you just created from surgery. Now, not to say that the efficacy is impacted. I haven't seen any study comparing timing of initiation of the actual stimulator device postoperatively and how it impacts outcome, but there is procedural preferences and some, you can, some people choose to turn it on right after surgery and, and some, some um, interventionalists choose to turn it on when the patients come back for follow-up at the clinic. Now, in terms of post-anesthesia um, care or just thinking about just the care you should be very actively thinking about after an implant is mobility. So when patients, when the implantation has been successfully done, it's been hammered and discussed multiple times. Lead migration is extremely critical. You want to do as much as you can to help patients understand that that is one of the things that they need to be aware of if they do not adhere to certain activity um, restrictions. And one of them involves twisting, um, bending, extreme flexion of the lumbar spine or extension of the lumbar spine. Um, the school of thought is four to six weeks postoperatively, trying to minimize that as soon as possible. Um, I've seen the use of abdominal binders put in place after the surgery to kind of remind patients that restriction is extremely critical. And most of the time when patients come back for follow-up or, or you know, for post-op wound check, you can remove the binders. And the other things to be aware of too, in addition to thinking about activity restriction, um, the use of antibiotics is controversial. Um, if patients are high risk, like Dr. Provazano had talked about initially, your best success comes from your preparation prior to surgery. If patients are high risk patients for, for infection, definitely discussing post anesthetic, um, a post um, antibiotic use would be critical, but it is not standard of care um, for, for these cases. Um, now, going beyond post um, use of um, antibiotics, the next thing is pain medications. Um, I personally do not give more than two to three days, but again, it goes back to the patient population you're dealing with. A lot of these incisions um, do heal fairly nicely, and uh, that within a week, most of the pain should be, the pain from the incision should significantly be better. Now, the, the other component to think about is after the surgery, when they come to your clinic, 
uh, is the wound and checking for things that are extremely critical after any operation, seroma, infection, and make sure there is no collection of fluid around where you've done some of these cases and ensure that the patient is going towards the right trajectory. I really would like to open it up to Dr. Ali as a neurosurgeon as well to comment, you know, some in, if there are other things that she would pay attention to from a paddle utilization standpoint. But, um, but regarding some of the post-op care, activity restriction is important, use of antibiotics is important if the patient's needed, and post-operative pain management, you know, could, could or may not, may or may not be as extensive depending on the patient cohort. I agree. I think in in uh, an appropriately performed implant, um, minimizing post surgical opioids is is important. I uh, will put patients on uh, scheduled doses of uh, muscle relaxants uh, for you know the first um, seven to ten days after a paddle implant, just because of the extent of the tissue dissection, and I find that is significantly more helpful than than opioids in helping with uh, the post-surgical spasms. Um, I also tend to inject uh, some longer uh, acting uh, local anesthetic once um, I'm done closing the fascia, um, especially in the area of the thoracic, the thoracic incision, which uh, is another strategy that can uh, sig significantly help improve post-surgical uh, post pain. And then long term, I think uh, with paddles, I worry slightly less about lead migration, uh, just because uh, of the way the the lead itself is anchored um, under lamina and then secured to the to the fascia. Uh, but I follow the, the the same rule of thumb where no significant twisting, turning, bending, um, heavy lifting uh, for the first few weeks after surgery. And I think it's important uh, to, to make sure that the patients know uh, and, you know, the, the pre-surgical neuropsychological testing plays an important role in ensuring that the patient is capable of taking care of the, the device um, or know what the red flag symptoms need to be that they need to contact us um, in the in the office, and um, I, I do think that a good relationship with the programming team is very important as well. Because as you're aware, sometimes these patients need to be reprogrammed several times before they kind of hit uh, a happy medium, uh, rotating between different uh, programming parameters uh, to to optimize the the pain relief that they're experiencing. So all of those uh, are considerations for me. What about you, Dr. Prabhavano? I don't know. I think they were all well explained about with activities and restrictions. I think I'm very impressed. All good answers. So really not much to add there, but I think excellent answers. Perfect. So we'll transition to our last um, discussion topic here. And before I get into this topic, I'll just say to you, you can start, a lot of people are answering some questions into the Q&A chat. So I encourage you to keep doing that. Our panelists are doing a great job at answering some of these questions. So you can go ahead and take a look and see things I've already answered and go ahead and get some questions in as well. Um, but going into our last discussion, I'll have Dr. Provenzano speak first and then kind of open up to the whole group. Um, but it's just kind of a, um, a vague question, and uh, Dr. D'Souza, I'll have you switch the slide for me. And the question is, you know, what are just some common pitfalls or mistakes that you see some fellows or early career physicians making with spinal cord stimulation? Yeah, so I think the one of the biggest things I'd emphasize, and like Dr. Ali, she's a neurosurgeon, so she has done many surgeries. Many pain physicians did not have formal surgical background or training. And I think that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. I love doing it, take pride in doing it. It's a great therapy. However, do I think someone should go out and do an implant after doing four cases themselves? No. If I went to a total hip and a total knee specialist and I said, how many knees have you done in fellowship? And they said four, there's no way I'd let anyone operate on me in four. So I think the first thing I would say to to fellows and early career physicians is implanting. It's a great treatment, helps a lot of people, but in order to have that privilege, you need to have a lot of cases under your belt and you need to be well-trained. It's just like uh, basketball. You don't shoot your first free throw in a game. You shoot it 
you've shot thousands of free throws before you um, get to the, the game. And so practicing your suture, all the things that you did during your surgical internship or surgical residency, on the doorknob, just start tying knots, making sure that you have really good surgical skill sets. If you're if you did not get that much training in your fellowship, that doesn't mean you shouldn't consider implanting in the future. Just means that make sure you have someone to mentor you at your first job. That someone's going to spend time with you um, and mentor you. So I think really focusing on good surgical skills. It's it's not an extremely complex type of surgery, but you need good surgical skills. And so what I would say to fellows and early career physicians is make sure you have good surgical skill sets. And then the last thing I would say is no matter how good you are, a complication is going to happen. And so I would start to have in my mind, if I have this complication, how am I going to handle it? You don't want to be thinking about your first complication when it's happening. Think about it before. What would I do if this gets infected? What am I going to do if someone's incisions come back and it looks red and it looks inflamed? What labs am I going to order? And this is a great time because you still have plenty of time in your fellowship to start to think about those questions. And while you have people around you, just ask them, you know, what am I going to do if this happens? So those would be some of the early things that I would say that make you a, a good implanter in the future. Dr. Aru, Dr. Ali, Dr. D'Souza, do you guys have one pearl that you'd like to share with everyone? Or did we get it yeah. all covered there? I'm, I'm happy to, that I, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Provenzano. Those are all excellent points. I do have one pearl that I would like to share. Um, so whenever I see patients with that have had spinal cord stimulator implants, I tell them this is not the end. This is actually the beginning. Um, I tell them to think of a spinal cord stimulator as a second chance. Um, my the, One of the biggest areas that I research is um, long-term habituation and ways to combat um, building up of tolerance to spinal cord stimulation, um, to, to just to spinal cord stimulation um, therapy. So I tell patients there's a potential chance that you know uh, that you might lose efficacy to spinal cord stimulation over time. It's hard to predict if that might happen or when that might happen. Uh, the best thing that they can do is to consider spinal cord stimulation as a second chance. This is when they should do things to continue optimizing their health, whether it's weight loss, physical therapy, and other things. Um, you know, it's, it's, when I first started off uh, in fellowship, I saw a lot of patients who've had spinal cord stims placed many years and they would come back and say they're no longer getting relief. And I would ask them, what have they done in the last two, three years? And they would say really nothing. I've, I've, done, I've, I've been pretty inactive, um, not really done physical therapy or anything. And I tell them that, you know, our pain, you know, our bodies will continue to degenerate and pain might worsen to the point where spinal cord stim might not be able to cover it. And so I really sell spinal cord stimulation as the beginning and as their second chance to really um, optimize their health. Excellent points. Um, I would just say patient selection is is key, especially when you're when you're starting out. Don't be afraid to to send patients away, let them think about things, and come back. Um, show you the commitment that they really are committed to the therapy. If you have patients who are not complying with recommendations to bring their diabetes under control, or going to their neuropsych visit or uh, making the effort to do a preoperative physical therapy or um, improve their nutrition ahead of time. All of those are, are, are a potential red flags that this might just not be the, the right patient. So choosing the right patient and setting uh, level setting expectations is, is key to having a successful practice. Yeah, the only thing I would add, I mean, all really great comments is remember your, you have access to resources, tap into your mentors, your friends, discuss your first case, your second case, your third case, your 50th case with your colleagues. And I still do that till today. And it's so refreshing when you piggyback knowledge with your colleagues and only to realize, oh, I could do it differently. I, I just never thought about it. I, I think it's such a good um, community to still stay in touch with because if you do that, I, I truly do think you can set yourself up really well, not just for success immediately, but long term as you encounter more complex cases. Great point. Brandy, can I say one other quick thing just before these yeah, are all of course. Great points? I think the other thing is you're going to be busy in practice once you start, you know, you leave your fellowship. Having people around you that help make the, the procedure successful. What I mean by that is even though I'm so many years into my practice, I still sit with my implanting nurse every Wednesday 
And at the end of the day, I run through cases that I have upcoming, cases that I've done or cases that they're following. And those people, if you have good protocols in place, for example, I'm doing a trial in two weeks. Have they been tested for MSSA, MRSA? Have they, do we have the preoperative, having it all templated out so you miss none of the key steps. And so people in your clinic also have these patients lined up for you exactly the way you want. Have you looked at your MRIs prior to doing these trials? Have you made sure that they have adequate room at T12, L1? Is there thoracic stenosis? Just, I would really, as you get busier, you're going to need people around you that really help you be successful. In order for them to be help you be successful, you have to educate them about the whole process of an implant and what they should be looking for before you go and what labs they should be helping you with. Fantastic. So that'll conclude our discussion topics here. We just have a few quick poll questions that I kind of want to ask the audience here. And so Dr. D'Souza, I'll have to go back one slide here and then um, I'll launch this. You guys let me know if you can see this here. And so the first question here is which of the following is false regarding complications with spinal cord stimulation placement? I'll give you guys uh, 30 seconds or so to kind of read through these answers and see which one of these is false. Okay, we'll end the poll here. So got a few trickling in, but so I'll share the results here. The correct answer, well, the one that was false was B. Um, the, and Dr. Provenzano mentioned this earlier, um, that Staph aureus is actually by far the most common organism related to um, infections with spinal cord stimulator placement. And the rest of these statements are true. Going on to our next question. Dr. D'Souza, I'll have you hide this slide. There we go. No clues here for this question. All right, next question is, which is the typical target for spinal cord stimulated treatment for refractory angina pectoris? Yeah, people are all over this one. So now you can show that slide, Dr. D'Souza. So people are right on the money on this one, T1 to T4 there. And this is kind of the chart of some other um, high yield targets. And last question here. So what is the purpose of a staged spinal cord stimulator implant? Dr. D'Souza, you must have done a good job with this question because people did great. So here is this. So perfect. Yes, exactly. To limit repeat attempts at neural axial access. So, so with that, um, I think for time's sake, we'll kind of conclude here. Um, people, if you go to the Q&A session, you can see a lot of the questions that have been answered. Um, or thank you panelists for um, working through these. Um, for any unanswered questions, um, we're going to take note of these and try to answer these via our social media page. Um, but with that, I'd like to conclude our webinar and thank you all for joining us this evening.